Here are some demos of resonance in tubes of air. Now what I've got right here is a straw and you can see I've flattened the end with my teeth there and I'm also going to cut off corners like this, like so. There's one, here's another one. And so now what I've got is a little reed here and I can see if I can get this thing to play. And it's kind of a trombone because I've got this a little stretchy straw here. I can even change the frequency even more by cutting off the end. So apparently, resonance in tubes of air has something to do with the length of the tube. What I have here are three tubes of differing lengths, and let's see what they sound like when I hit them on this thing. It's the longest one. That's a shorter one. Here's the shortest one. So you can hear they have different resonance frequencies. Let's see if I can play a song with these things. Hey, but uh, yes, the resonance frequency does depend on the length of the tube. Sure enough, the longest tube has the lowest resonance frequency. The shortest tube has the highest resonance frequency. Higher frequency means higher pitch. The note is a higher pitch. Now, resonance frequencies depend on several things for these uh, sound waves, standing sound waves. Uh, they depend on the length of the tube. They also depend on whether the tube has an open or closed end. For example, you can see this tube, it's got two open ends. Uh, or I could put a closed end on it like that. There's a closed end, open end, closed end. Um, it also depends on the speed of sound. Those demos would sound different if I was in an atmosphere of hydrogen or helium or any other gas besides nitrogen and oxygen, which I'm in right now. Now, near any tube open end, there will always be a displacement antinode. In other words, the uh, whatever gas is in there, air in this case, will be able to move in and out of this thing at the open end. There'll be an antinode there. The air will move back and forth at that end. Whereas at a closed end, if I cap this thing, Air can't move, can't move there, it's stuck there. So at a closed end, there will be a displacement node. And you will notice that I'm saying it's uh, a displacement antinode is different than a pressure antinode, as you would uh, see in the lecture before this. So as we're about to demo here, different frequencies will resonate inside any tube. So I've got a couple examples here and I'll show you them right now. Uh, I can get actually more than one frequency to resonate inside this tube. It says C on it, but there's actually many, many frequencies that will resonate within this tube. And if it resonates, uh, the way you tell that is the sound will become very much louder than the tuning fork by itself. Now, when you actuate any of these tuning forks, make sure you only hit them on your shoe or something softer than your shoe. If you hit them on anything harder than your shoe, you can actually damage them. So let's go ahead and see if these different frequencies resonate. Let's try this one first. There's the tuning fork by itself. Hopefully you can hear that it's much louder when I bring it near this tube. It's resonating. Let's try this one right here. Now hopefully you can hear, there's not much difference. You can't, this one's not resonating. Let's try another one right here. Hopefully you can hear that that is resonating. So only certain frequencies will resonate inside this tube, but it's not just C that will resonate. There are other frequencies as well. And let's do a little bit of math and some diagrams to figure out exactly which frequencies will resonate inside this tube. 
So when we draw these standing waves, the first thing you have to understand is that what we're going to draw is the displacement graphs of these longitudinal standing waves. It's really hard to draw a longitudinal standing wave because the antinodes would just run over the spots where the nodes were. It would just become a big jumbled mess. You can't really draw them. It's really easy to draw transverse standing waves or the graphs of the displacement. Uh, so we're gonna just draw the graphs of displacement and keep in mind it represents a longitudinal standing wave. And we're gonna do it for the first three frequencies of standing waves that will resonate in these open and one end closed tubes of some arbitrary length L. The other thing you have to understand is when we talk about the fundamental, uh, when we did those original transverse waves, we showed that, oh, you just count the number of antinodes and that's the harmonic number. So one antinode means it's the N equals one wave. Well, it's a little bit more complicated with these things, uh, but what we're gonna say is that the fundamental frequency is the lowest frequency that resonates. And then if you double that frequency, that'll be the N equals two. If you triple that frequency, it'll be N equals three. As, Cause as we'll see, uh, the, the lowest frequency that resonates here may have more than one antinode. But if you just realize what we're calling the fundamental is simply the lowest frequency that resonates, you'll be all set. Let's first look at double open-ended tubes. What this demo is showing is a standing longitudinal wave for a double open-ended tube. And notice a couple things here. First of all, at the middle of this tube, look what these molecules are doing. They are just standing still. That is a displacement node. Look how the displacement graph is represented. Notice that at that point, that red line showing the displacement of the particles, it doesn't move right in the middle. The particles are not moving. At the ends, however, the particles are going to a maximum displacement, which is actually a little bit out of the tube, and then they're going to a minimum displacement, which is somewhere inside the tube right over here. And notice on our graph, that completely corresponds. They're going out of the tube, that's maximum positive displacement, and they're going inside the tube, the uh, negative displacement to the left. So this is a transverse graph of this motion right here. And notice that we can see all the different parts of the graph. Uh, if we tried to draw a picture of this, we'd have these particles running over all the other particles and we really difficult to draw that. So we prefer to draw a transverse graph of this motion right here. So notice that displacement, I've got displacement antinodes at the end of the tube. And I've got, a, uh, there's another displacement antinode. And there's, for this first harmonic, the fundamental, I've got a node right in the middle of the tube as well. Notice you can also graph pressure. This is divergence from average pressure, which would be, uh, what would this be right here, this level right here, which looks like zero on our graph. The average pressure would be, of course, atmospheric pressure. Notice that in the middle, these particles getting squeezed together, our displacement node is a pressure antinode. Notice that if we're graphing pressure, this middle point is where the pressure gets very high, gets all squeezed together, and then it gets very low when the molecules are all spread apart. And at the ends of this, you'll notice that these molecules right here, they stay the same distance apart the whole time. So if you're looking at the pressure of this area right here, it's always staying at atmospheric pressure, which is indicated by these sets of particles over here. So you'll notice that our graphs of displacement is different than our graph of pressure. We actually prefer the graph of displacement. Let's take a look at the next higher harmonic, which is called the second harmonic or first overtone. Notice I still have antinodes at the end, but this time I, had, I have an additional antinode. And you can see what's happening here. We're going to primarily look at our displacement graph. Antinodes at the end but I've got another antinode right in the middle. Notice that this part in the middle is moving maximally back and forth as well. But this is how we'll draw it in our tube. I'll go higher, up higher one more. And this is the, they call it the second overtone, which is the same as the third harmonic. Uh, and again, we have antinodes, displacement antinodes at the end, 
but we have two additional antinodes right here as it moves back and forth maximally and right here as it moves back and forth maximally up here. So let's go ahead and start with our double open-ended tube. We've got for this tube two open ends right there and there. And we, so that is our n equals one. Our lowest frequency is called the first harmonic. And our, what we wanna do here, the way this works is, we will always end up with a antinode, a displacement antinode at any open end. And that's how we gotta draw these. We gotta figure out how can we get a, an antinode there. So I'm gonna draw them just like the transverse graphs. They're just graphs though. And here is my antinode right here. And then it crossed over there and then I got another antinode out here. Now these are sinusoidal, don't draw straight lines. And you'll also notice that I've drawn these a little bit out of the end of the tube because these antinodes actually happen a little bit outside of the tube. Uh, as you saw in that uh, the, the uh, animation, so we do have to draw these a little bit outside. There is a correction factor that uh, whenever you're uh, playing a wind instrument, uh, the antinode doesn't quite happen inside the tube, so you have to uh, adjust it for the correct tuning a little bit. So all you gotta realize is that the antinode actually happens a little bit outside the tube. That's called an end effect. Now you'll notice that I've got antinode there, and I've also got an antinode at the other end. Now let's go ahead and figure out what the wavelength of this one is. How to do that? Well, you might say, oh, the wavelength is just L. But notice that it does not go from here to here. That is not a wavelength. Because notice it's going from the crest up here to the trough down there. Crest to trough is not a full wavelength. You could figure out that, oh, crest to trough is half a wavelength. And then you can figure out that, in fact, lambda is equal to 2L. Uh, here is another way to figure that out. Uh, if you realize that half, uh, every time you go from a crest or an antinode to a node, that is always one quarter of a wavelength. From there to there, antinode to node is always lambda over four. So we can see that there are two lambdas over four here. So the way I could figure this out, if you wanted to, you could say, oh, well, since uh, L equals, there's two of them, so that's lambda over two. And that means that lambda equals 2L. If I just move this two over there. So that's another way to figure it out. We could just count the number of uh, times we go from an antinode to a node. That's always lambda over four. So in this case, lambda is double the length of this thing. This is only, inside there's only half a wavelength. Okay, so let's go ahead and try the, uh, the next one here. And this is gonna be n equals two. It is gonna be double the frequency, n equals two. And again, the goal is I've gotta get an antinode over here and an antinode over here, but I need the frequency to be higher, so th this is gonna to have to be a shorter wavelength. In fact, I'm gonna add an antinode Every single time, I'm gonna add an additional antinode. So let's see if we can do this. Here is my first antinode out here, and then I'm gonna have another antinode in the middle, and then I'm gonna have an antinode out here. And then I gotta draw the dotted lines in here. So notice I have three antinodes. Again, it's just n equals two, because it's only the second frequency, the, the next highest frequency that appears in this tube that will resonate in this tube. Uh, what is the wavelength of this? Well, you can figure out, okay, how many of these quarter wavelengths do I have? Every time I go to an antinode to a node, it's a quarter of a wavelength. So from here to there, that's a quarter of a wavelength. From there to, up, oh, from there to there is a quarter. From there to there is another quarter. And from there to there is a quarter. Hey, I have got a full wavelength in here. Notice I've got one, two, three, and four quarter wavelengths. So that is a full wavelength. Lambda, in this case, equals just L. Another way you could show that would be to pick up this end and just place it over here like that. And you see how, oh, when you just cover up this part, if you covered that up, you'd see, oh, see, that was a full wavelength. I just moved that end over. 
So that's another way to see that that's a full wavelength inside there. Lambda equals L. Now let's go for this one. Again, I've got to have antinodes at the end, but now I've got to fit in an additional antinode. How am I going to do that? So here's my first one way out here. I need one more, I need another one more, and then down here like that. There, I've done it like that. Uh, a little bit off over here, I'm gonna try to fix that one down here. A Little bit more curvy there. And notice again, the antinodes go a little bit outside the end here, but you can see what's the wavelength here. If you count these quarter wavelengths, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's th six quarter wavelengths, by the way, this is n equals three. Uh, and I'm gonna move this down up a little bit here. So, what is the wavelength lambda? So tell you what, let's figure this out. L, the length of the tube, is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. It's six quarters of lambda. So what is lambda equal? Lambda equals four six of L, or in other words, lambda is equal to two thirds of L. And let's make sure that makes sense. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, if you uh, notice that uh, if I take this end right here and I just added it over here, like that, and I've got, uh, notice that this, I've got three of these now, this part right there, that's L, and there's three of those antinodes in there, two thirds of that, is a wavelength. So the wavelength is two thirds of L. So that is correct also. So now the next thing I want to do is I want to figure out what the frequencies are of these things. So to do that, I have to rely on my master equation for waves. V equals lambda F. What is the frequency equal? By the way, this is the speed of sound. The speed of sound won't change. I'm doing all these demos in air. Speed of sound won't change. The frequency, solve for frequency, you get the frequency equals the speed of sound over the wavelength. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use V for the speed of sound, and let's calculate the frequency for all these. For this one, it's easy. Frequency is V over the wavelength. Its frequency is V over 2L. Let's do it for this one right here. Frequency is, in this case, the speed of sound over L. Now notice this one right here is twice as much as this one up here. So the second harmonic, sure enough, does have twice the frequency as the first harmonic, just like we had for those transverse waves in a spring. Let's try this one right here. What's the frequency right here? F equals V over two-thirds of L. Now we gotta do a little math there. That equals three V over two L. We'll notice that this one, three V over two L, is in fact three times V over two L. So yes, it works. The third harmonic is three times the fundamental or the first harmonic. Frequency.